what I would like to do, if I may, is take you back, actually back to the very beginning of the service, when most of us were out there in the garden. I read something at the beginning, which was the introduction. You'll see it if you turn back to it in your bulletin. For this, the service for Palm Sunday, where we reenact Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It's not just something that we commemorate, but rather notice the last line of that introductory paragraph. We, I read, let us go with him in faith and love so that united with him in his suffering, we may share his risen life. And then the same phrase about walking and going with Jesus also is picked up right down here, very next page, bottom, under the collect, where we pray, mercifully, mercifully sorry, grant, that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share in his resurrection. In other words, the point of doing this what feels for many people like this extraordinarily disruptive service. I mean, I usually let you get, come in and sit down and say hi to people and then be quiet. You mean I gotta get up and stand up there and in the heat, sing a song I don't sing very well. We only sing it one time a year, you know, so I don't even know that I know it. And we're walking, we're holding these pump. What's, what's that about? Well, it has to do not only with a reenactment, of an historic event and all that that means, but we're actually invited to do something about it in our lives. And so that's the question for me. What does that mean to do something about it in our lives? And I would want to say that it has everything to do with what we pray. Be careful about what you pray, even in the liturgy. God may take you up on it. What does it mean? It means, what does it mean to walk with Jesus. Now, I know he's with me. If you're a Christian, you say very clearly, the promises of God are, I will never leave you or forsake you. Nothing can ever take you out of my hand. Lo, I am with you always, with you, you see, even to the end of the age. Okay, so that means wherever I am on the whole planet, Jesus is always there. There's never a place where I am where he is not because he is both Lord of the whole world, he is also, if I'm a Christian, he literally, by the Spirit of God, resides in my heart. So I can never go a place where he isn't. Besides, since I'm a Christian and Jesus is living with me, wherever I am, he's still right here, right? Nod your head. <laughs> so, but here's how we think about this. This is the challenge of a day like today. More often than not, when we think about the fact that I am, that Jesus is with me, that means, notice, did you hear the way I used the pronouns? That wherever I go, he is. So that no matter wherever I am, he's there. So that I go about my life, I do everything that I need to do from go to the office, to go to the grocery store, to pump gas, to go out to dinner with friends, to go to my kid's ball game, all of the things that might be a part of my life, those are the places I go. And no matter what happens, Jesus is always there with me, even if somebody tries to run me off the road or something terrible begins to happen, Jesus is still there. He doesn't vanish or at some point go, oh, this is too big for me, you're on your own on this one. No, I can count on him. Right? But you see, this introduces something different. It means if I'm supposed to walk with him, as well as the fact that he is with me, that means he might have a different agenda. Huh? There might be things that he wants me to do in places where he wants me to go that <laughs> it's not in my planner, it's not in my day timer, it's not on my phone calendar, it's not what I think about. See, that is what the scripture is talking about. You see, in the scripture, when Jesus talks about him being with us and me being with him, he talks about, he uses the analogy of a yoke. Not an egg yoke, but an oxen yoke. And what it looks like is there's a bar and then there are two things underneath it. So if it's placed on the oxen, it's right around the oxen's neck and then the bar, and the bar goes across to another oxen. And the yoke is right there, right on top, so that hopefully what's going on is that they're always walking together. Because if they don't, obviously one of them's pulling against each other, and it's pretty uncomfortable. I have a feeling that what's true, at least 
for my life, I'm sure it's true for yours too, unless you're, unless you're more religious than I am, it, <laughs> is that I count on the fact that Jesus is with me all the time, but I don't necessarily think very carefully about where it is that he wants me to go. And so the experience is, is that I'm walking along doing it, and then it gets really uncomfortable at times. You know why? Because Jesus is wanting me to go one way and I'm going the other. And even though I may not be thinking that through, sometimes I just feel like, oh, what happened? This isn't very comfortable at all. No. And the invitation today <laughs> is for Jesus and you, Jesus and me, to walk together. And it starts right here with the Palm Sunday celebration. This is meant to be out of our comfort zone and a little bit disconcerting because more often than not, the routine that I described about wanting to come into church, you know, it's predictable and I'm in control and I know what's going to happen and I like that. This is meant to be somewhat disruptive because you see it's introducing to us in a very kind of reenacting kind of way that we're, when we're with Jesus and we're called to do what he asks us to do, it can really ask of us some things that are pretty out of the ordinary. Look at what's going on. What we have in this story, the story of Palm Sunday, is in fact a calculated confrontation. They just weren't sort of walking down the field and deciding, oh, what if we get Jesus on a donkey and bring him into Jerusalem? Oh, what a great idea. No, 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 no. There was, this was a very calculated act to introduce to as many people as possible that Jesus was, in fact, who he all, all along had been saying that he was, which was the Messiah, the King of Israel, the Son of God. And so what they do is intentionally create a series of circumstances enacting the very prophecy that is in the book of Zechariah that was read when Deacon Sam Dilke read it. He said from the prophet Zechariah, Pay attention, daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming on a donkey, on a fold of a donkey. Who is it? Your what? Your king. That's why Father Rob said something to the kids about, mm, this is worrying. Because think about it. They're about a quarter of a mile away from the city of Jerusalem. They're on actually the Mount of Olives, and it's up high. And you kind of go down into the old city. They've already created this advanced signal. And the signal is we're going to get the donkey and the donkey's colt. Notice the foal of a donkey. There are two animals here. And which is exactly what Zechariah prophesied would happen. Something very unusual. You see, this wouldn't happen normally. If somebody's on a donkey, there'd be one, not two. And so that's a part of the detail that Matthew brings out to point about, out the fact that this is important. This is unique. So they've already... We don't know how this happens, but they go to someone who's got it, and he says, the Lord needs it, and the owner says, okay, you may borrow it, or it's yours. And they go and they bring it, and they put Jesus on it, but they don't just do that. They put cloaks, meaning their outer garments, like a cape, and they put them on it. They put Jesus on the donkey. So here are the disciples, and they're leading Jesus on the donkey, colt right beside, and they're beginning to make their way this quarter mile into the city of Jerusalem. But it doesn't stop there. The disciples, as Rob rightly points out, got palm branches, a sign of political loyalty and royalty, and they are starting to wave them. And what are they saying? Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In other words, they, to all of the pilgrims who are around them, are declaring Jesus unequivocally as a religious messiah and a political king. These are almost all Galileans, these disciples. So as remember, you read in the gospel when Peter speaks up and it says his accent betrays him. They know that these are not the local Jerusalemites who are in fact doing this. So is this, it could raise all kinds of questions. This is high risk behavior, in other words. Could the Jewish authorities could say, is this some kind of insurrection from the north and Jesus is their military leader? 
Who is this who is pretending to be some kind of king? And the religious leaders, of course, would feel the same because they're calling him a prophet. He's the Messiah. Who this is, the chosen and the blessed one. In other words, as they're making their way in, and of course, the crowd begins to pick up the chant. It gets larger and larger and larger. So that even if you're on the other side of a city wall in Jerusalem, you hear the cries and you understand what they mean. They are messianic. Christ. No wonder the scripture says that Jerusalem was in what an uproar. This is enormous what's happening. So, what does it mean to walk with Jesus in the midst of that kind of enormous event? Number one, it's a willingness to say, are you willing to be a bold and public Christian? The disciples took an extraordinary risk. They could have been arrested at that very moment. The Roman garrison should have come up and could have come up and said, this is a political pretender. This is going to be a, a political rebellion. We've got to quell this right now. Or the temple guards, remember they had their own set of guards there too. They, they were their own militia. They could have just as easily dragged them all into for what? For blasphemy. They didn't do that because God wanted something to be done. But the fact of the matter is they did not know on the front end whether or not there was going to be any kind of personal cost. There could have been, and they knew it very, very well. The Roman guards were ruthless. So the question for us, if we are walking with Jesus, there will be times where Jesus calls on us to speak boldly and to be bold Christians. To be a Christian, in other words, does not mean to hide out to blend in and hope nobody notices. There will be times when you will be called to speak up, to make a declaration of who you are as a Christian. And to walk with Jesus, in this case, is to walk with Jesus in a place where you are called upon to be bold. Secondly, to walk with Jesus in this is to notice something else about him, and that is the animal that he's riding. He's not riding a military steed. This is not a horse. Jesus is not carrying the, a sword. This is not about a military confrontation. But instead, a donkey? Who is that? The donkey is a beast of burden. And when Zechariah quotes the fact that the Messiah would come on a donkey, he's making a point about the kind of rule this Messiah will have. It's like the line, you may remember it, out of the hymn, Lead on, O King Eternal. For not with swords loud crashing or roll of stirring drums, in other words, military might, but how? But with deeds of love and mercy, thy heavenly kingdom comes. In other words, boldness for a Christian does not mean coming in and charging the barricades and taking over political power. There are some Christians who would really like you and I to do that. It is the wrong thing to do. It has nothing to do with the gospel. But instead, our bold witness has to do with what this, what this donkey represents, this beast of burden, the willingness to be a servant, the willingness to stand beside those who are in need, the willingness to go and to take our place with the outcasts, to be with people that the rest of society goes, oh, we don't know whether you belong here or not because you're surely not one of us. <laughs> Because in the eyes of God, you see, all people matter. All people. It doesn't matter their educational level. It doesn't matter their race. It doesn't matter what they've done in the past. It doesn't matter whether they have a good or a bad reputation. It doesn't even matter if you're being invited into a place of danger. If Jesus is calling you to go there, then you darn well better be there. Because I would rather be in a place of danger in the presence of Jesus rather than being in the safety of my living room with a yoke around my neck pulling me into a place where I know I'm not doing the right thing, God. Has that ever happened to you? <laughs> Calling to live out a life of love and mercy can in fact be an extraordinarily challenging life. <laughs> As Don Miller, the author, says, God did not call us or even promise us a comfortable life. Instead, 
He calls us and promises us to have a life of meaning. That can be something very, very different than just remaining parked in front of your TV. So today, to walk with Jesus on this Palm Sunday is to think about boldness, public Christian, standing with those who may not be those other people care about, bringing in through deeds of love and mercy the very, the very wonder of the gospel, the Jesus who cares and loves all people, whether they deserve it or not. Because who are we? Come on. We don't deserve the mercy of God. We don't deserve His forgiveness. And if you think that's true, then uh, you may have to get corrected by God on that. <laughs> All of us before Him, you see, are sinners. None of us deserve His mercy. And yet it is out of His great love for the human race that He comes to you and me and says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. All. Not just, this, not just that we think who deserve it. God cares for everyone. And therefore, I would invite you today, as we begin to walk through Holy Week, to think about what does it mean, not just for Jesus to be with you, but for you to walk with Him and wonder and pray about where He might be. Amen. Amen. Amen.